Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to, to Oxford. Um, as I was just saying to, to, to the guys on the panel, for once, the, uh, the, the virtual background you can see here is actually an accurate depiction of, uh, of the, the weather we're experiencing here. So we're, we're having some, some good fine weather at the moment, and um, that's, uh, that, that's kind of brought good spirits to, to everyone, I think. Um, great to see so many people joining from all over the world today, um, as, as is usually the case with, with these sessions. I can see we have people from, uh, from North America, uh, from Asia, and from, uh, from other parts of the globe as well. So it's good to have a good uh, international audience. Uh, my name is Jonathan Dover. Um, I'm the a recruitment manager for the Executive MBA here at, at Oxford Said. Um, I look after uh, North America and Africa uh, in terms of regional responsibility. Uh, I'm joined on the call today by my colleagues Susanna and Alejandra, um, who, who you'll see in the, in the Q&A and the chat. Um, and also our, our panel, who I'll introduce fully um, once we get to, to the Q&A, but we're joined uh, by two of our alumni uh, and also someone who is currently studying on the programme to, to get their perspectives on some of the things that we'll chat about in the presentation. Um, and also there'll be an opportunity for, uh, for you guys to, to put some questions their way as well. Um, feel free to put some questions in the chat as we go through um, and we'll try and get to, to as many of them as we can. Um, so I want, to, I want to start by by saying that when I when I first started working at uh, at Oxford five years ago, one of the first people I met uh, was a lady called Kitty, who um, was a member of our January seventeen cohort. And in many ways, she was very similar to a lot of the people I came across in in my previous career in in, in exec search. She was a very uh, senior finance professional who'd already had an extremely successful career, uh, extremely polished, extremely articulate, and clearly an expert in her chosen field. Um, but what was very clear to me that, that that wasn't enough for her and she wanted to apply her skills in a, in a very different context um, and, uh, and, and become a more effective leader. And it was, it was a real privilege to watch her develop over the course of the program. Uh, and, and she's now the CFO of a business which uses virtual reality to uh, treat a variety of mental health issues. So that, that, that's just an example of you know, how transformative the, the EMBA can be. Um, and, and hopefully... You know that 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 example will will kind of shine through when we uh, when we get to chat to uh, our alumni at the uh, at the end of the session as well. Um, next slide, please, please, Alan. Uh, now, normally at this point, if uh, if this were an in person session, I would ask ask if uh, someone in the audience could could name that building. But uh, we'll uh, we'll just go straight to it and uh, and say that this is uh, this is the Radcliffe camera. So this is very much. The type of image, I guess, that, that people would think is synonymous with, with Oxford um, and the sort of image you have in your mind when, you, when you're thinking of Oxford. So the, the, the dreaming spires and the 800 years of tradition, et cetera. Um, Side Business School is, is a relatively young business school in, in global terms. Um, but we have the advantage of being embedded within this world class historic university. So in contrast, the, the business school is, is that young dynamic business school with, with state of the art facilities. Um, to support a world-class community of, of faculty and research. Uh, and I guess really that we, we should think of the business school as being a department within Oxford University. So in addition to that global network that you'll be a part of at the business school, um, as a participant on the EMBA program, you'll also be a member of an Oxford college, um, giving you ac access to a wider network of faculty, research and, and, and alumni. Um, and we're very much looking forward to, to welcoming our latest cohort to, to Oxford in September, uh, many of whom I'm sure you will find uh, burning the midnight oil in the, the 24 hour Sainsbury Library, which you can see on, on the first floor here. Uh, nice. No, so you're, you're probably all wondering what you'd be getting yourselves into uh, if you are to successfully apply for the programme. Uh, so that would be between 15 and 17 week long modules, um, depending on your elective choices and whether you start to choose the programme choose to start the program, sorry, in January or September. Um, so that means that you would travel to Oxford for one working week every five to six weeks, roughly, over the course of the program. Um, each class will be made up of around 70 students from across the globe, um, and a little bit more about that later. Um, your learning will be made up of 12 core courses and four electives. This gives you an opportunity to, to tailor the executive MBA to suit your particular motivations and, and areas of interest. Uh, and you can see there as well, there'll be an opportunity to study at, uh, at up to three international locations. Um, the core themes I've included there as well, because I think when you're, when you're comparing different programs, different business schools, um, that's a really good way of working out which program is gonna be best aligned with your, with your motivations. So the, the core themes of our program are strategic leadership, 
So have you been operating at a strategic level for a significant period of time? If so, you know, you're probably going to be the, the sort of person that we would want in, in, in one of our executive MBA cohorts. Entrepreneurial thinking. So that, that can be in the context of a, of a large corporate business or more traditionally in the context of, of a smaller business. And definitely the, the Ember program has proved to be a really effective vehicle for, for helping people to make that jump into entrepreneurship. Um, but also helping people who have already made that jump to, to help scale their business uh, and, and utilizing the, uh, the, the Oxford network to, to help to do that. Uh, and finally, global, global complexity and risks. Now, it, it, this is a, you, you would be entering a truly global cohort. So if, if one of the big motivations for you in doing an executive MBA is to study alongside lots of different nationalities, people from uh, different parts of the globe, um, then that's definitely a, an area where, where the Oxford program really does, does come into its own. So what would your EMBA your typical EMBA class look like? So, so on average, people have around 15 years of work experience um, with at least five years in, in what we call a strategic management role. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to be uh, managing huge teams. It could be, for example, leading on, on large scale projects um, or looking after a portfolio of clients, for example. Um, but we feel that in order to, to have the, the right level of, uh, of discussion within, within the classroom, um, it's really important that all of our participants are able to demonstrate that, that strategic uh, mindset and, and have that strategic experience to, to, to back that up. 36% um, of, of this class, so the, the, the January 22 class, are, are female. Uh, and increasing female participation continues to be a big focus for the school. We're really looking to, to push that figure uh, up to 40% and, and above. Um, so there are usually between uh, 30 and 35 different nationalities represented in each class of 70. Uh, so it is a, you know, a truly global program. Um, and within each class, usually only around 25% of, uh, of the class will be UK nationals. Um, with the rest from all over the all over the world, and and looking at the figures here, I think I'm right in saying those are actually based on on, on where people are located, so it's so, so where they're based, um, rather than necessarily nationality. So that gives a you know a, a good a good reflection of the the truly global reach of the program, uh, and we do look for for all of our applicants to to have that sense of a global perspective. Uh, and, and people who are looking to engage with peers from, from different cultures. Um, it, it's fairly rare for people to come onto the program who you know, haven't had, had exposure to different, doing business in different jurisdictions, for example. So that's a, that's a big focus for, for us and a big focus for the program. Uh, in one particular cohort, there, was actually, there were actually four students who uh, commuted from Australia for each individual module. Um, so they, they really clocked up the, the air miles, but uh, that, that's an extreme example. Um, but I think it does really help to, to illustrate the global nature and the, the global reach of the program. Um, and you'll usually find that up until the, certainly the, the Wednesday of each module week, there'll, there'll usually be someone in the class who's, who's still suffering from, from a bit of jet lag. So you'll always be, uh, be amongst friends in that respect if you're, if you're traveling from afar. Um, not something else to flag as well. We have a, a school-wide target of 10% African participation across all of our programs, um, which we have hit um, for, for, for most of the, certainly the last few EMBA cohorts, uh, and that will continue to be uh, a big focus for, for us and, and across the school. So that's a, that's a target that we have across all of our programs. Yeah, so as well as being internationally diverse, uh, a typical Oxford Executive MBA cohort will usually have uh, between 25 and 30 different industry sectors represented. Um, and we have a really good track record of attracting people from industries that you wouldn't ordinarily expect to find uh, in, in an MBA classroom. Um, so, so yes, there'll always be a good chunk of people from, from financial services and consulting, uh, but we do tend to get people from, from, from quite different sectors as well. So a, a number of people in each classroom, the likes of healthcare, education, construction, uh, nonprofit as well. So um, we feel that that's a, a real sort of key differentiator for the program. And if you are looking for a cohort where you're going to be exposed to a range of different industry sectors and different perspectives, um, rather than necessarily just growing your, your network in, in your own space or your own industry sector, uh, that then the, the Oxford program does provide a, a great program, great platform, sorry for that. So yeah, I want to chat briefly just about the, the, the application process itself. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, keen just to, to give everyone a, a, a brief overview, really, and then hopefully we'll get into to, to some questions and, and discussion with, uh, with our panel. Um, but uh, in terms of the application itself, um, just the, the, the key highlights. So you will need to provide copies of your, your undergraduate degree transcripts and a CV. 
Um, you'll also need to provide a, a GMAT or executive assessment score, um, although in certain circumstances it is possible to, to request a waiver from the standardised test. Um, you should speak to your uh, recruitment manager um, for, for, for your region um, about your eligibility for that and they'll be able to, to talk you through that process. Um, there are three essay questions which probably make up the bulk of the work that you'll do as part of the application. I'm sure our, our panel will remember that fondly and be able to, to chat about it in, in, in a little bit more detail. But um, probably the, the key thing to highlight is the, the third essay question that you will do as um, that you'll do as part of the application. So that focuses on, on, on a challenge or a difficulty that you, you face in your current organization. Uh, and asks you to suggest different strategies or solutions to, to combat it. So um, th that, that's the largest essay, the longest essay in the, um, in the application. So it's important in that sense. Um, but quite often the answer does form part of the basis for the discussion in, in the interview once you get to, to that stage of the process. So definitely worth spending a good amount of time on. Um, you also need to provide two references. Uh, and a TOEFL or an IELTS score if um, you've not studied or worked extensively in English before, or if your uh, undergraduate degree uh, was not was not in English as its main main language. Um, and again, on all of those points, uh, if you're if you're not sure about any of that, or or you want to kind of just chat through your eligibility more general more generally, um, the best thing to do is to to contact the recruitment manager for your region. Uh, you'll be able to find the, their details on the website, and they will be able to advise you. Um, as to your suitability for the program overall and to, to walk you through the process. Yeah, so I wanted to chat, just mention briefly some of the scholarships that, that we have on, on offer. Um, I don't want to go into this in too much detail because obviously everyone's situation is, is different in terms of funding. I think it's fair to say that in most cases, participants fund their EMBA from a number of, number of different sources. Um, but I think it's useful just to highlight um, some of the scholarships that we have, and this ties in with, uh, with, with the application deadlines for the upcoming classes, which I'll, uh, I'll highlight as well uh, in a moment. Um, so you'll see there, for example, our director's awards, which are worth up to, to £30,000. Um, we have a number of scholarships aimed at women. Um, we have the, the Hashmuk Patel Graduate Scholarship, which is aimed at African applicants and is worth the full uh, programme fee. That's only applicable to the September intake, I should stress. Uh, and also the Oxford Alumni Scholarship as well. So as you can appreciate, all of those scholarships have, have different criteria in terms of eligibility. So again, um, chat to your recruitment manager um, to see if you could be eligible for some of those scholarships. And if, uh, if relevant, definitely go ahead and, and apply for those. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so here are the, uh, the upcoming application deadlines. Uh, we're currently accepting applications for the September cohort this year, um, as well as the January cohort starting in, in, in 2023. Um, so you'll see that the, the final deadline for the September uh, intake is, is approaching. Um, still, still a little bit of time, though, if you, if, you are, if you are able to consider an application for September. Um, in terms of the January application deadlines, you'll see there's still quite a few left there. Um, that July 25th deadline is definitely a key one to highlight if you want to be considered for, for those scholarships that you can see mentioned there. Uh, and similarly, the September the 5th deadline and um, before the final deadline in October. Um, worth mentioning that we assess all applications on a rolling basis. So regardless of, of when you apply, um, you can uh, anticipate some, some feedback, usually within, within 10 working days from the submission of a complete application. Um, as to whether you've been selected for interview, um, and then, then the rest of the process will, will run from there. But certainly, if you are interested in applying for, uh, for scholarship funding, um, definitely worth bearing those, uh, those application deadlines in mind, certainly for the January intake. Um, and yeah, as I say, the final deadline for September is August the 15th. So certainly, if, if that is an option for you, still, still plenty of time to, to pull together an application. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so that's um, that's actually the Ember 13 class at their graduation. That's where, where it can all can all lead to. Uh, you can see they're all, all having a great time there, and uh, no, no doubt pleased to, to get to the end of the road as well, and, and some 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 element of relief. Um, but uh, I just wanted to pause at this point really and check if there were any particular questions on um, the, the presentation on the program, um, and then we'll hopefully move into a discussion with our uh, our alumni panel. Um, so I think a few have come through on, on the chat. So first of all, someone has asked, have the scholarships for the September intake been allocated? Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, they have been now. So there, there's only the one deadline left for September. 
um, and all of the funding has been been allocated for September. Yeah, a good question actually on the uh, on the third essay that I mentioned in the application. So whether the challenge being faced can be a historic one, or does it have to be a new problem which hasn't yet been addressed? So, so yeah, it can be either. I think it tends to work better in terms of the uh, of that answer if it's a relatively recent uh, issue, if it is one one in the past. But it should be. I think the key thing is it should be something that you've been quite closely involved in. I think sometimes. Um, particularly people working for large corporate organizations sometimes fall into the trap of going for something that's quite quite high level within their organization, but isn't, isn't necessarily something they've been particularly closely involved in. So that that's that's the one piece of advice I would give you uh, give you on that. Uh, Johnny, sorry, there are a couple of questions as well from Melissa. What are the international modules for September two thousand and twenty two? Okay. So the international modules, oh, yeah. I mean, the compulsory, the compulsory one is business in emerging markets, and that will be taught across, you have a choice across Peru, China, and India, as it stands right now. And, and then you also can select a couple of electives that are also taught internationally, but they're not compulsory, but just very, very popular. So the ones I think that Johnny, you mentioned earlier, so in entrepreneurial finance in Palo Alto and inclusive business in South Africa. Yeah, so the, and I think I'm right in saying that there are that there there is a limit on the number of spaces available on the on those modules. Um, but but usually the vast majority of people who, who want to take those um, those electives will will get to take them. Um, and yeah, in terms of the the, the core international modules, um, there will be an opportunity to do to do one trip to either uh, China, India, or Peru, and then there will also be a week in in Oxford, which will uh, look at global opportunities and threats. Um, someone has asked, uh, what is the program duration? Um, so, so yeah, to, it, that will vary slightly depending on whether you start the program in, in January or September. Um, if you start the program in September, it will last uh, 24 months. If you start it in January, it will last 22 months. Um, and that's, um, that's, due just, that's due to the, the, the way the scheduling works out, but also due to the, the, the elective choices as well. Um, so a slight slight variation in terms of how, how long it would take, but either either way, it's um, going to it, it will work out at basically every five or six weeks. You would need to travel to, to Oxford or to one of the international locations for uh, for one of them for one of the module weeks. Um, so so that will that will remain the same. And in terms of the the electives that you actually have to choose from, um, and the the kind of typical class demographic etc., um, that will remain the same as well, regardless of whether you start in September or January. So it's really just a, a question of um, what what start date works best for you in terms of what you've got going on both both personally and professionally. Um, Diana has asked, what's the typical level of pre reading for each for each module? Um, so it tends to be quite a popular question. I think the, the, the guideline that we suggest is that in between each module, um, you should allow um, eight to 10 hours per week um, for, for pre-reading and, and preparation for the next module. Um, definitely have come across people who have done more than that and maybe some people who have done a little bit less. So I think, you know, ultimately it comes down to, to your working methodology, as it were. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you can, if you're looking to work out how to sort of carve out your time, um, then probably eight to 10 hours per week is, uh, is probably a, a good yardstick to go by. Um, someone has asked, what is the total cost of the program? So the, the current cost of the program is 98,540 uh, pounds sterling. Um, and when will scholarship opportunities for September, 2023 be open? So um, the applications for, for that intake will open you it's still to be decided but it will probably be sort of mid to late november this year um and at that point the um the, the scholarship deadlines will be will be published on on the website as well so um they, they will follow a similar pattern to to the september 22 intake um and uh, you'll be able to see them from november this year um and i think one one final question before we before we move into the the, the q a with our alumni um, just on, on what the required GMAT score. Um, so in terms of the GMAT, um, anything, um, anything 600 and above is, is, is worth submitting with an application in terms of 
um, giving the admissions committee comfort around those elements of the program. And um, the average score for the program is usually around 670, 680, something like that. So if you're if you're wondering what kind of a good score to shoot for would be in terms of making your application competitive, um, that would be that would be the score to, to aim for. Uh, the executive assessment has not been around for as long, so there's not the same kind of track record in terms of what a good score looks like. Um, but it, it, it seems to be that anything north of 150 um, would be it would be a good score. Um, so that once you once you're hitting those kind of numbers, then then that's a, a score that's worth submitting with your application. As I mentioned earlier, um, it is possible to, to have the GMAT requirement waived in certain circumstances. Um, so that's one that's worth uh, raising with your recruitment manager when you speak to them. Um, OK, so I think we're going to move into the. Um, move into the Q and A with our alumni, or two, two alumni and one current participant, I should say. Um, so I'm going to get you guys to to introduce yourselves quickly first of all, just in in turn, um, just so everyone can uh, get a get a flavour of uh, of your of your background and uh, what sort of stage you're at in terms of your your EMBA journey, if you like. Um, and then we'll we'll move into some questions. So maybe if we start with uh, Joanna. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, great to be a part of this program. Um, my name is Johanna Chardon. I'm based here in New York City and built my career here in New York um, and was part of the S18 program. So we graduated right at the beginning of COVID. So graduated online, but now we had an actual graduation just a week ago, which was really, um, really a fantastic time to get together after COVID. I am the founder and CEO of Salt Exchange, which exists to empower strategic giving. We serve philanthropists in the US and some international at this point. We officially launched in January 2021. Um, just knowing that the philanthropic market is inefficient, we need to serve philanthropists and help them be more strategic about their giving. Just a little bit about my background. I'm a CPA or chartered accountant and was working with the various global firms in New York City, and but a bit more of an entrepreneur, so try to create a firm a couple of years ago that did not work, but I managed bumping into the head of a hedge fund who had a family foundation. And that's how I got involved in philanthropy. I started working with him and it's just been, um, it's just been a journey ever since. So it's just great to be here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Joanna and, uh, and Steve, could we ha have a, a little bit from you next? Certainly can. Hi everyone, um, it's great to be here. Uh, so I was part of the uh, cohort that started in January 2020. So uh, just a couple of modules before COVID hit uh, and then had a mix of remote and hybrid uh, courses uh, before going back to fully in person towards the end of the, uh, the program. Uh, so I'm based here in the UK. Uh, I actually live quite close to Oxford. Uh, so Oxford was an easy choice for me. But, you know, even even with living near Oxford, I still managed to get a fantastic experience as a result of the uh, Ember program which we can talk about shortly. Um, I am also a qualified accountant, which I hadn't realized, Joanna. Um, I've had a very corporate background in the last 20 years prior to the Ember, uh, working in you know, large companies in financial and commercial roles. Um, but that's uh, changing uh, as we speak. Uh, I set up a company just towards the end of the program. I'm currently uh, in Sainsbury's, a large grocer uh, in the UK. Um, but on an interim contract, I'm doing this, frankly, to earn some money while I'm setting up the business. And the aim is to focus 100% on the on the startup post October. Um, and, you know, the Ember really gave me the uh, the confidence and purpose to get out, get on with that and start start making some progress. So I uh, look forward to talking a bit more in due course. Thanks very much, Steve. And last but by no means least, Kit, who I don't think is a qualified accountant. Otherwise, we've got a full house. Um, but uh, yeah, Kate, Kate, you started the program in, in January this year, so you're at a kind of a, a totally different stage in, in the process, which hopefully will provide, uh, provide the audience with uh, a, an interesting perspective, I think. Yes, absolutely. Um, I am not a qualified accountant. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so as Jonathan mentioned, my name is Kate Prince. Um, I just started my EMBA about six months ago, so happy to provide um, my sort of current real life perspective on, on the program. Um, I am based in the UK, uh, but only have been based here for about four months. Um, I was in Minnesota in the United States prior to that. I have a background in consumer packaged goods working for uh, General Mills. Um, I started my career in General Mills in finance. 
um, and then moved into marketing and working for a small food company in Boston um, with my most recent experience um, heading store experience marketing at Target, which is headquartered in, um, in Minnesota as well. Um, I, uh, let's see. What was there? Was there another thing we had to cover, Jonathan, or is that it? No, uh, that, that's fine for now. It was just a, sort of some quick introductions, and then we'll move into sure. some more more specific questions. So, so I think the, the, the first thing really that I wanted to cover, and I, I think this is a sort of a really important topic as we kind of emerge, hopefully from the pandemic, and uh, and, and get back to whatever the, the new normal is going to be. Um, you you so certainly both both you, Steve, and uh, and certainly UK, you both had experience of uh, the program being delivered online virtually but also being delivered in person so i wanted to to get certainly both of you to, to chat a little bit about your experience of both of those some of the pros some of the cons um and as we move back to an exclusively in-person program um what do you feel what do you feel that holds for for the incoming class in, in september uh, maybe start with you steve if that's okay yeah sure so i think um, for me, a big part of the Ember program, and I'm sure it's the same for many people on the call, is all about the network. So it's about who you meet on the course and, you know, the friends and business contacts that you build for life, essentially. And that was certainly my experience. I'm still uh, happily friends with many people I met on the program. Um, and of course, remotely, that building those relationships are just so so much more difficult than they are in person you know the the after class conversation down the pub or over dinner just doesn't happen when you are remote you know we we had two in-person modules before the pandemic hit which were great i mean not not great for the liver because there was a lot of alcohol consumed frankly uh, for me but um if that's your thing but um it was really a great opportunity to get to meet everybody and without that um I just think that the value, of course, the academic content's the same. The delivery, what you're learning is pretty consistent, um, but the ability to uh, interact with the professors during breaks, during dinners, and, and just getting to know people at a personal level just doesn't happen. Like we had, I think, six or seven remote classes from kind of May through September, October 2020, and it's quite difficult to keep focused for, you know, and the you know, the, the business school did the best they could to accommodate the fact that it's hard to stay on Zoom for eight out nine, nine hours a day. So shortened more kind of material outside of the lessons. Uh, so you weren't on Zoom literally all day for six, five or six days. But it was quite tiring. It is quite tiring, you know, having to uh, go through uh, on, on Zoom uh, all day for, for a whole week uh, in some cases. So there's the tiring aspect, the lack of its social interaction, less ability to uh, build personal relationships. So for me, you know, if it was a purely remote, I don't think I would have, if it was a purely remote, I would have probably, which a lot of people did do, uh, deferred to a future year. So, you know, one of the things that happened in our cohort of 72, I think we had half the class deferred to J21 or J22. Um, but on the positive, some of S19 and, you know, uh, S, sorry, S19 uh, and J19 deferred onto our course. So the, the benefit of it was actually, yes, some of the people that I'd met early on moved into a future year, but actually I got to meet a lot more people that joined us. Uh, so there was some positives from uh, that experience, which is I have now over 100 friends rather than 70, as I would have had. But um, the experience um, when it was remote was nowhere near the same. And even the hybrid courses, I was fortunate living close to Oxford, I could join in person all the hybrid courses, but the just the mixture of having the teacher having to deliver or the professor delivering online and in person is, you know, it's just more difficult. And the call, the, the conversation is harder just to have on a more natural level, I guess. Um, and then you just don't get to see everybody. So you feel a bit bad for people that aren't there and a bit left out. Um, but you still, you know, you do get to uh, still meet some people, but generally it's the more UK people I got to see on hybrid because generally they were the ones that could travel during the travel restrictions. So definitely on the in-person versus remote, I'm one of the people that would say, you know, absolutely in-person is the only way to do uh, an Ember program. And as long as you're, as long as your liver has recovered now, that's the, that's the main thing. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's still, um, those evenings still go on. <laughs> So uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, I can imagine. But uh, but yeah, no, I think I think a lot of that rings true with a lot of the feedback that that, that we've had, and you know, I think 
clearly the program can be delivered very effectively online, um, but it's uh, it, it's all the kind of external factors around the program, such as you know th those those little interactions with with your cohort, other people at the business school, um, getting involved in the, sort of the wider Oxford community as well um, is obviously very very difficult to do online. So yeah, we're certainly very excited about hopefully everyone being being back on on campus from the start of the next academic year. Um, Kit, did you want to to add add anything to that? I mean, I, I'm guessing. Steve's touched on a lot of the key themes that you might have done anyway, but but as a sort of as a newbie, is there is there is there anything that, that you would add having experienced both? Yeah, yeah, Steve definitely touched on uh, the majority of um, the points. I would say we had our first module fully online, um, and then from there we moved into hybrid, which we're currently still in hybrid. Um, what I would say is fully on fully online or fully in person is probably are probably both better than hybrid um, hybrid has been challenging um, that said to echo steve's point in person is by far the best we haven't had that experience quite yet but we've had the majority of our our cohort together during our matriculation module um, i guess what i would say probably the one benefit to online or having virtual or hybrid options is one obviously travel we do have people coming from New Zealand on Australia they don't need to do that level of travel and just having that flexibility is is likely nice for them. Um, and then I would say the other is our sessions are recorded, which has been actually quite beneficial when we're thinking about um, assessments or just wanting to go back and, and listen to something that the professor has gone over understand it a little bit better that's definitely been a benefit. Um, you know, in person, you get the networking, which Steve hit on, I think, um, experience, you're, it's, it's Oxford, like, you, you want to be at Oxford and experiencing the incredible surrounds of the university, being able to go to the Oxford Union, um, listening to speakers, we do college dinners, um, once a module to, at a different college each time. I mean, these are things that you just can't experience if you're online. Um, and then I would say just class dynamics. The professors work really, really hard to make sure that they're being inclusive of, you know, our zoomies as we call them. Um, but it's very challenging to run the class um, in a really sort of smooth, dynamic fashion when you've got people online and it's hard to kind of keep track of who's raising their hands by the time the professor gets to them. We've maybe already moved on to a different point. So I think it can be very challenging for those people that are virtual to feel like they're really able to participate in a meaningful way. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, that's that's really kind of interesting current current insight as well. And I think you know just uh, an, an example of uh, I guess the challenges that, uh, that that we've had to go through in terms of program delivery over the last couple of years. And I think we've we've certainly got pretty effective at some things, but equally pr pretty keen to get back to that exclusive in person experience, so that you know we can we can have everyone on campus together and really taking advantage of, uh, of, of the whole experience. And um, so kind of leading on from that, um, Joanna, maybe if I can, can bring you in here, but just to, to talk a little bit more about, I guess, that the, the, the Oxford experience for, for want of a better phrase, because, you know, I think, you know, so I, I think if I'm right in saying that you were definitely someone who, who really took advantage of, you know, sort of interaction with your, your college and uh, sort of some of the stuff that goes on across the, the wider university, as well as just the business school, because I think it's really important to sort of look at the business school as a department within in the wider university. And sometimes when we have sessions like this, that can maybe get a little bit lost. So I don't know if you can maybe say a couple of things on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I would echo everyone's comments regarding, I mean, there's pros and cons to being online versus in person, right? We all know every decision you make has pros and cons, but there is something about him being in person in Oxford. You can't replace that, right? In terms of just being there and being having access to that network. What I would add to Jonathan's question is that um, I, I was proactive about my experience in Oxford. And I think everything you do is dependent on how proactive you are, right? You do not have to engage with the college you're assigned to. But if you choose to, it's an amazing opportunity to meet tutors at your own college, to find out about what they're doing in different um, areas that you're really passionate about, whether it's, I was a part of Keeble College, and that was an amazing program to have access to because they are, they're interested in entrepreneurship and they're doing some really innovative things. And so to be able to go to Keeble and meet various people that could speak into my life, but also help me think through um, different things that I was doing was, you know, you can't really, you can't really buy that. 
Um, also, I think even Kate had mentioned the access to Oxford Union or Oxford Foundry and all the different programs going around Oxford, you have access to a lot of those things. Some things are just for college specific students, but a number of things are open to everyone. So there's so much happening right in the college area and at the different schools and different um, affiliated programs that with entrepreneurship or other things you can just really benefit from. So um, even when I went back just recently for the graduation, I connected with a professor who's, who is focused on fintech. And fintech is not 100% my area, but there's some things that are overlapping with what we're trying to do. And he was happy to meet with me, even though I've never taken a class with him. And we really just went through some things that I needed to learn about. So there is, I mean, there's just so many opportunities to being there and being a part of the Oxford network that you just can't replace. And you don't really get that experience, even in Ivy League schools here in the US. They have an amazing network, but Oxford is a leading program with just so much going on in so many different colleges that it's just, an, it's a real honor to be a part of it. So on, on that note, a question just come in which kind of follows on from from that so you've sort of you've, you've flagged a couple of the, the reasons there I guess already but um Veronica would like to know why you chose Oxford over some of the schools in the US because there's clearly some some pretty good options closer to home so uh, what was your what was your thought process there I think that would be really useful to hear yeah great question one of my board members when I was applying to Oxford even though he was a Keeble alumni was like why are you going to Oxford you know you've got all these Ivy Leagues here in the US and you know, for me, it just completely made sense. I built my career in New York and I wanted to get out of the US context. And then Jonathan, I think you referred to this earlier. It's a global network and it's a leading university with just influence in so many different areas. And so I wanted to get out of the New York bubble. I wanted to look at things from a global perspective and I'm so glad I did it. Uh, the, uh, the peer group I met that came around from all over the world in our cohort uh, was fantastic. And, you know, in certain programs, you're not going to get that in the same way in the U S plus we were able to look at things from an international perspective. Um, and, and I also, I think if you ever visit Oxford, if you haven't visited Oxford, I would highly recommend it. There's something energizing about being there. There's something that you can't, I mean, the history there is, is just, you know, you can't, you guys know how old it is and, and how much influence it has. So I think for those, I mean, for a lot of different reasons, but those two primary, I really had to look at the global impact and then just being a part of that Oxford network was, was priceless for me. And looking back, it was, it was the right decision to make. Yeah. Was the, um, was the program structure or the format, was that a, was that, was that a, a part of your decision-making process in terms of the, the week-long modules versus some of the weekend programs? Yeah, absolutely. I preferred getting together every four to six weeks for an intense week rather than just doing, for instance, NYU has a part-time program here in New York where you can do a weekend, which is 100% fine, but there's something about getting away from work and your context, getting away for a full week with around 70 students doing the same thing and energizing each other and speaking to each other's life. And as Steve mentioned, going out to the pub at night, right? And just engaging over a beer. Um, there's, it was a, a really um, inspiring experience that you're not gonna get unless you have that intense week together. And everybody is either working full time or just has family at home or different things. So we're all different, dealing with different challenges. So we're all able to be an encouragement to one another but just being able to have that intense week and step away from everything and then go back to your country and city and get work done. Um, yeah, that it just was a very unique experience and that intense week was worth it. And maybe bring you in on that, Kate, as well. So how, how are you finding the, the, the program structure and the format sort of uh, a, few, a few months in rather than sort of coming, having come out the other side like Steve and Joanna? Yeah, um, I was, I was going to add on um, to what Johanna had said about uh, kind of the reasons for choosing Oxford for me in, in addition was the, the program format. Um, I think every executive MBA program, certainly at some of the best business schools in the US are every other weekend. And I just think you can't, it, it's so much harder to develop the, the depth of relationships that we're able to develop when we're there for a week. Um, and often people are coming on Saturday and they're not leaving till the following Sunday. Um, and so you're just getting this really, uh, just incredible uh, time to, to, to connect in this incredible place. It's just, it's something you can't replicate, I don't think at any US university. 
Yeah, and uh, that, I mean, that certainly tallies with a lot of feedback that, that I get just in, in, in my role as the, the recruitment manager for North America in terms of people's kind of motivations for uh, looking at the program initially and then once they're on it, when they kind of make that make that comparison. So it's good that that's kind of uh, sort of bearing through for, for you. Now, a question from uh, Jeffrey that's come through on the chat. Um, so Jeffrey would like to know, when did the modules get intense and, uh, and how did you each cope with that? What were your sort of coping mechanisms, I guess, he's asking for, uh, for, for coping with that. So maybe, maybe start with you, Steve. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, I think it progressively got more and more intense. And I think that's because for me anyway, I put more and more pressure on myself to, to, um, do a better and better job so I was spending more and more time trying to read around the subjects and I think um, I would say probably mid mid course I would say early 2021 for me was was the key thing which was like 12 months in because all of a sudden you, you start to have a multiple uh, modules ongoing so you've got the module which is every five or six weeks but then you've got pre-reading for future modules as well as doing the assignments for the past modules so you, you end up in you know you're in different modes of having to complete your assignments which are usually two to three thousand words um and then pre-reading for uh, future co uh, future modules and some of the modules have more intense pre-reading than others and some assignments are more involved than others as well so i think for me middle of the program it all kind of came together as a lot of pre-reading and quite a few assignments building up and i think coping mechanisms First of all, you've got to be really organized, I would say. Try and be really organized because, um, you know, if you don't spend that time every week that you mentioned, Jonathan, around, you know, your eight to 10 hours, um, you will start to have a, a kind of a time where you've got a lot more than eight to 10 hours to do in a week in terms of pre reading, because there are, you know, there are um, different levels you can go to. You know, there is normally essential reading for a module. There'll be then optional reading for a module. And then if you really are interested in a module, there's even more reading. And the professors do a great job in terms of selecting the best, most relevant articles for you to read. Um, but really, if you, depending on how much you want to get, get out of it, really is the effort that you put in into that pre-reading and you want to go into the module with a reasonable background so you're not spending the week trying to learn what you you know what it's all about you, you want to go in there so you can actually actually engage in the material and ask questions and not be worried about the pre-reads and you know the case studies that you might have to do so i think um mm. yeah middle of the course it, it be diligent around um really organized around when you're going to do pre-reads when you're going to do your assignments you know assignments can take a bit of time um but yeah really being really organized i would say i actually was fortunate the second year of my program i actually left my job and uh did um, was purely focused on the MBA as well as my family life, uh, which really helped. Um, but actually, in a bizarre way, I was much more organized in the first year when I had work because I was much more organized and I let myself go a little bit in the second year because I had a bit more time on my hands and I probably wasn't as organized. So that'd be my main advice. And people that are traveling, you got a lot of time on the, on the planes, right? So aeroplane journeys, I hear, even though I'm based in the UK, aeroplane journeys are quite good for uh, doing pre reading. <laughs> Yeah, often that's offset by the jet lag, depending on where you're coming from. But uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a good time to, to get get the head done, I think. Um, jo Joanna, do you want to, to add anything on, on that, on coping mechanisms and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, the only thing I think I would add is that I, I really leaned on peers. And I think you're going to find that rather quickly when from our first module, I think we had statistics and that is not my expertise, but all of a sudden in the classroom, there are people that were really experts in statistics and started helping everybody else in the classroom. And so it built community, but also it was an amazing group to lean on. So I found almost every module we've started doing that, right? Who was an expert in various topics that we could go to and say, how do you, you know, how do you look at this? How do we, how do we think about this? How do we prepare for the finance exam if we don't have backgrounds in finance? So it really becomes an amazing uh, foundation to be able to get through the program with. Um, and then just, I, I would agree with Steve, there are times where I was able to read a lot of the materials and times I couldn't, and you're able to balance that. You, I mean, you make your own, again, you have to be proactive about your experience at Oxford. So you can, you can do the minimal, or you can really go after learning as much as you can and taking advantage of the, of the material and everything. And so that is a personal choice I found. So, but the, 
program does get harder as it goes on. I felt like the first module was a get to know you. And so we did go through statistics, but still it, was, um, it wasn't as hard as it was as it continued. <laughs> but at that point, as it gets harder, you do have a community and you do have an amazing um, support group through Oxford, uh, the professors and others to learn from. Yeah, I think that, that that proactivity is a really a really interesting point. One of uh, one of our other alumni described uh, the program as being like being part of the best gym in the world. Um, so basically, basically it's all there for you, but you've uh, it's it's kind of up to you when and how you uh, you use all, all the equipment. So I think definitely being being proactive is uh, definitely key to getting the most out of the experience. And uh, I guess it might be possible to sort of coast through, but the, the vast majority of people are, are here for more than that, which is which is great. Um, so I wanted to touch on international diversity within the program next. And, and I guess just ask each, each of you guys in turn whether, A, that was a factor in you choosing the program, the fact that it is such a diverse cohort. And then when you were on the program or when you are on the program in Kate's, in, in Kate's case, um, have you been, were, were, you, were you surprised by how diverse it was and, and how, how did that impact your experience? Um, maybe starting with you, Kay, actually. Sure. And actually, I do want to just add quickly to the last uh, question, because I do think there's an important point to, to add on there. And that's, um, there's, I was actually taking notes from you guys around when the actual course load gets challenging, since I'm only six months in. Um, but I think also family. Um, I think it's important to go into the program fully aware that it's going to be really challenging for your family as well. Um, and I think that we are all we are all starting to realize that that is picking up now at about six months into the program where it's a, it's a little less exciting when we leave every month for our family. Um, and so making sure that there's that support built in before you go into the program, um, I, I would just, I think is important to mention um, to make sure that your, your experience is successful. Um, in terms of the lover, level of diversity, I, I wasn't surprised um, just really candidly because that was one of the reasons I chose this program is I knew it would be incredibly diverse, um, just having looked at kind of the makeup of previous cohorts. Um, but coming from the Midwest the, in the United States, working for two large Midwestern organizations um, where we didn't have that level of diversity in the workforce, it was it was really important for me to have that experience at Oxford. And so um, I've been, I mean, though I wasn't surprised, I've been blown away by the amount, just the sheer level of talent in the cohort. It's 70 people. And yet you've just got this incredible diversity of background and experience, ethnicity, religion, um, country. I mean, it's just every facet is, is diverse and it's um, the just the level of unique perspective that that brings to each of the modules that we've been in so far has been really amazing. Um, I think sometimes it's easy to think, you know, having maybe worked for a global organization that you have a lot of that perspective, but then you put yourself in, in you know, uh, we just did um, firms, firms and markets and, uh, global rules of the game. And you put yourself in, in that module for a week with people from all over the world with just this sheer uh, diversity of experience. And you realize that you, you didn't have a global perspective. So um, it's been, yeah, it's been really incredible to be part of. Thanks, Kate. Um, Steve, was your experience similar? Is a lot of that ring true with you? Yeah, exactly the same. Like we had 34 nationalities, I think, across our 72, initial 72 people, all continents um, represented. And actually, not just, I guess, national and cultural diversity, but also just range of industry and range of experience, um, all just helped to have really good in-class discussion. And, you know, to, to what Kate just said, you know, you think you've got a you've got a reasonable view but actually when you get talking to people that you know come from different backgrounds that you don't ordinarily talk to you, you, it brings a completely different perspective to things and you know, I, I didn't realize one of the things I was going to say earlier but you know there is a lot going on I saw the question from Renzo just here about uh, entrepreneurship and things but there was a vast majority of people that are into the entrepreneurship side of things at Oxford. It is a very, you know, you mentioned at the start, the entrepreneurial side of it. That was the thing that attracted me in the first place. And the vast majority of people were very entrepreneurial, either had their own business, were executives in, in a business or wanted to start a business. And, uh, you know, just interacting with those types of characters uh, from a different, you know, diverse background was 
really first inspirational for those that have actually done it, succeeded and telling the story, but really kind of um, built confidence and really motivating to actually get on with it rather than just talking about it. Um, so for me personally, it was the diversity helped me uh, in terms of make some decisions and move forwards with my career as well. Perfect. And uh, yeah, I'm just conscious of time. So we're, we're just kind of coming up to time, but I think a good place to finish perhaps would be maybe to hear from, from you, Steve, and you, Joanna, on what you've been doing since the program. And I guess specifically how you feel your, your studies on the EMBA has, has impacted that, how, how it's been useful. Um, and yeah, maybe just a, just a, a couple of little bits around that, because I know you've, you've obviously both gone on to, to do some, some interesting stuff since completing the program. So maybe starting with you, Joanna, as the, the, the sort of the, the earlier of the two uh, alums we've got. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm not the best classroom learner. I don't know if there's people listening that, you know, get a lot out of the class and that's probably not my, my expertise, right? I rather practical application and figuring out how do we, how do we apply this on the ground rather than sitting in a classroom talking about it. So for me, leaving and thinking through some of the frameworks, like the lean startup idea, or how do you market certain things that we learned in class, when I actually could take that and apply it, that was really where I think for me more of the growth happened. And so you can do that during the program, but of course I started my venture in January, 2021 officially. And so just looking back and thinking about the different things we learned in the cohort. Um, and again, just applying those different frameworks and modules, I was found very helpful, um, has been able to help me even, yeah. let, me just, let me just back up and say, even we had a, a meeting with Reed Hoffman from, um, if you guys know Reed Hoffman, a one of the founders of LinkedIn. And he turned around and said, hey, if you're, not, um, if you're not embarrassed by what you first launched, you launched it too late. And even a comment like that was profound as I launched my startup because I'm a perfectionist. So I always hold back when, I, you know, when I'm trying to get something out. But just hearing those type of you know, comments from leaders like that, my, you know, frameworks that we learned in class and thinking through how to apply it just really took my startup to the next level. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, and Steve, what were your sort of main main takeaways? Would you say? So my main takeaways is a couple really. One was, um, I said my background was quite corporate before I joined uh, Oxford, and you know I was very much on the traditional businesses or businesses here to make money, and that was my view on 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 life in the commercial world. And I came out of the Ember journey absolutely around business is you know it should be a force for good in the world over that you know we talk about it you know the whole ESG agenda and how does how does business be a driving force to solve world problems or to certainly be good in the world and there were so many examples in our cohort you know people investing in you know um, in Africa was a big one actually you know venture capital trust in Africa and investing in businesses that were doing the right thing for the world and that was my one of my key takeouts and actually became the purpose for my my new startup um, and, and gave me that kind of, you know, kick up the backside, if you like, to get on and, and, and start up the company that I always wanted to start, which I hadn't. I hadn't got out of the cycle of being in corporate life, but it gave me the confidence, a lot of the frameworks that Joanna mentioned around just um, what you can apply to, you know, how you can really uh, have a successful startup, especially some, around, some of the things around venture financing and how you raise money in, in, in the early stages of a business so helpful but it was more that purpose-led business so my business going forward is very much it's, it's in the data space but it's it's all around how do you how do you allow the everyday person um gain value out of out of their data and it's it's um it's really given me a purpose that i'm not in it to make money i'm in it to make it a uh, life better lives for, for people uh, generally and i think that was a big take out for me and i think i don't not sure i would have got that elsewhere um, but just the diversity and the entrepreneurial side of Oxford, I think, you know, really changed my view on that. And that has, as I say, given me the, uh, the confidence and drive to, to, to drive it forwards more so than, than before. Thanks, Steve. I think, I think that's probably a good, a good place to, to finish up. I think there's probably quite a few more questions that we could have got to if we had a bit more time, but alas, we don't. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to Joanna, Steve and Kate. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule to, to do this. I think it's, it's really useful for um, people who are looking at the program to, to get it from the horse's mouth, as it were, um, and uh, to get some, some, some real life uh, experiences and uh, perspectives on, on, on what people 
part of the program while they were on it and, and in Kate's case while you're, you're doing, doing it currently so so that's been, been really useful thank you to uh, my colleagues uh, Susanna and Alejandra for uh, uh, manfully uh, and asking answering questions in the chat I think there have been quite a few coming through and as I think uh, Ali put put in the chat if, if you do have any follow-up questions um, please get in touch with either myself or one of my colleagues in the recruitment team um, you can find all of our details on, on the website sort of relevant to your specific region. So, so do follow up with us that way uh, with any additional questions. Hope, uh, hope you've all found today useful. I think there's been some really uh, interesting insights have come out of it and, uh, and hopefully that's given you uh, a good kind of update on, on where, where we're at with the program in, in terms of uh, deadlines and, and application process as well. So um, that's all for, from us today. Um, but yeah, do keep in touch and uh, feel free to, to reach out to, to me or, or the team in, in the near future. Thanks very much, everyone.